Hello everybody and welcome to chapter 3 where we'll be talking about sensation and perception. So when we talk about sensation, we're talking about our five senses. Vision, hearing, the sense of smell, which we call olfaction, the sense of taste, which we call gustation, and touch. So why do we study sensation and perception in psychology? Well, as we have said, psychology is the scientific study of behavior and mental processes. Behavior are all of our outward actions, all of our behaviors, things like talking and your facial expressions, your movements, um, what you do, running away, hitting someone, right? All of these, a smile. Um, and mental processes include our emotions, our memories, our thinking, things that are happening in our mind. And really the final outcome of sensation and perception is your behavior or your thoughts. Meaning you first have to sense something, you see something, and that makes you uh, move away so you don't hit into it as you're walking. Um, you hear something and that makes you sad. You have an emotion, let's say. Let's say. Um, you smell something and it brings back a memory. Um, so the final step of sensation and perception is your behavior and your thoughts and emotions. So psychologists therefore have to study sensation and perception to understand our thoughts and behaviors. So this is another subfield of psychology. Again, you could take an entire semester class on sensation and perception. We're going to cover it um, just pretty quickly in this chapter. So what is the difference between sensation and perception? Sensation is the process by which your sensory organs um, that are in your eyes for vision, your ears for hearing, your nose for smelling, right? Your mouth for tasting, your skin for touch. It's the process by which these sensory organs, and we'll talk about them, those are your sensory neurons, receive and detect stimuli. So activation of the sense organs, and again, those are the receptors in your eyes or your nose or other um, parts of your body, um, are activated by a source of physical energy. So if you think about seeing something, light has to hit your sensory receptors in your eye, and the sensory receptors in your eye are called rods and cones. We're going to go through that. You may have heard that term before. So light hits the rods and cones and you see something. We call this a passive process of big bringing information from the outside world into the body and the brain. The process is passive because you don't consciously engage in sensing the sensing process. All you have to do is close your eyes and then open your eyes. Light hits your rods and cones and you see something. You're not thinking about it like, okay, now I should see something. It just happens. Or um, an example of hearing a tone. All that has to happen is, I don't know, you're just sitting there and a fire alarm goes off and you hear it. You don't have to do anything about it. It's a very passive process. Now you could contrast that with the idea of perception. Perception is the interpretation, the analysis, the integration of stimuli, and this is carried out by the brain. We call this an active process because you're selecting, you're organizing, and you're interpreting information that's brought into the brain from the senses. So again, let's say you hear a very shrill tone, um, you sense a very shrill tone, that's the sensation part. Now the perception part would be, what is that tone? Is it a fire alarm? Um, is it a neighbor playing terrible music? What's that sound? That's your perception and that's the active process um, that we go through. So as an example, let's just take a look at this elephant for a minute. Just take a look at it. And let me know how many legs this elephant has. Hopefully by now you're realizing this is harder than it looks, even for students taking a college class. Um, this is called the impossible elephant. And this gives you an idea of sensation versus perception. 
sensation is just looking at this elephant and seeing this picture in front of you. Again, a passive process. Light is reflecting off um, your computer screen um, in this pattern, and you see this image in a very passive way without thinking about it. But the perception is, what am I seeing? How many legs? Is this a leg? What's going on here? Is this a trunk? Is this a leg? How can I count these legs? That whole process is what we call perception, and that's the active process. I hope that makes sense. When we're processing sensory information, there are two kind of processes going on at the same time. We can talk about bottom-up processing and top-down processing. Bottom-up processing takes very basic information from your sensory stimuli and processes it, processes it for further interpretation, um, like a camera taking basic information to make a picture without any expectations. So from bottom-up processing, you're processing the little bits of information, visual information or auditory information, and you're putting it together from the bottom up to make sense of it. Top-down processing, on the other hand, starts with drawing on your past experiences, your past knowledge, your understanding of the world to interpret sensory information. And this is a very human skill. So when it's dark outside, and let's say you're trying to read a sign, you're trying to find a, a particular building, a particular store, and it's dark and you can barely see the letters, uh, but you can look at the shapes on the signs and put them together based on your past experience to read the sign because you kind of know what those letters should be. So bottom up is just taking the very basic sensory information without any expectations and building kind of your sensory experience from the bottom up. Top down is taking your experience with the world and putting that your knowledge onto the sensory information that you're given to make to help yourself understand what it is that you're seeing or hearing. Um, and typically top-down and bottom-up processing work at the same time. So it's not just one or the other, they're both happening together. Um, and if you were to take a look at this and read these two lines for me, um, you could go ahead and read them out loud to yourself over here. And I'm guessing you said A, B, C, D, E, F, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. The interesting part here is that thir the B and the 13 are exactly the same shape in terms of what your brain is sensing, um, your eyes are sensing. You're getting the exact same figure presented to your um, eyes. Um, but you're also using this top-down processing to say, well, if there's a letter or symbol between A and B, or A and C, sorry, it's very likely to be the letter B. And if there's another symbol somewhere between the letters, the numbers 12 and 14, well, that's probably 13. And so in this case, you're using the bottom-up processing to just look at the little symbols and decide, yep, these are letters, these are numbers. And then you're using the top-down processing to figure out when something is a little bit ambiguous, what it should be. And in this case, we figure this would be a letter B. And in this case, we would think it would be the uh, number 13. Another example, can you read the sentence? Um, take a look at the sentence and see if you could read it. If you need to pause for a second to try to figure it out, please do that and then start up again. And hopefully you can read, it says, can you read this sentence which has every third letter missing? So you need bottom-up processing to perceive all the actual letters in this sentence. And then top down because we're missing information, but we kind of can figure out based on our prior experience with reading and language what those letters should be and what those words should be. 
So again, bottom up and top down working together. Another important um, term in sensation and perception is called transduction or to transduce information. Transduction is the process of transforming physical stimuli into neural signals. So we need to take physical stimuli like light and turn it into a neural signal. We actually have to turn this into an action potential. Remember we talked about that's the way our neurons send messages is with action potentials. And so that is transduction is to change um, physical stimuli that's going on in the world into action potentials. So sensory input from the environment, and that could be light waves or sound waves or pressure on your skin, is translated into the electrical chemical signal of neurons, um, which is an action potential, and that process is called transduction. The neural signals are detected in your central nervous system, that is the sensation part of the process, and then those sensations are assigned meaning and that is the perception part of this process. We also have quite a bit of variations in our sensory abilities. So um, in order for us to be aware of sensory information, our sensory organs need to be able to detect it. Um, and again, we've got sensory organs in our eyes. Those are our rods and cones. In our ears, we call those hair cells. Those are the, the sensory neurons. Um, we have a lot of sensory neurons in our skin for touch, in our nose for smell, and our taste buds on our tongue for taste. And so you could imagine um, that there could be a sound so soft that if you are, even though there is a sound going on, your ears can't hear it. It's too soft. It's below the threshold that our ears can hear. Same with vision. There might be a light way out in the distance. Imagine you're out in the dark, uh, totally dark field somewhere. It's a dark moonless night. There may be a light somewhere far away, but it's so far away that you can't perceive that light. And that's the idea of absolute threshold. It's the weakest amount of some kind of physical stimuli that can be detected 50% of the time. It's the smallest intensity of a stimulus that must be present for it to be a threshold. And so the idea of hearing the tick of a clock 20 feet away, that may be your absolute threshold. Um, or smelling one drop of perfume throughout a six-room six apartment. That may be the lowest amount of a sense of a smell of a chemical, you know, the chemicals that are in perfume is what you're smelling, that you could, um, you know, take a, a sniff and say, hmm, I smell perfume. Um, or a candle flame seen from 30 miles away on a clear, dark night. So each of our senses has an absolute threshold, which is the smallest amount of that stimulus to be felt. But for each of us, it's different. There are some kind of general principles or general um, rules. Uh, but of course, for everybody, it's a little bit different. And there are factors that account for variations in sensory abilities like genetics. Some of us have better hearing than others. Some of us have better uh, vision than others, right? And that's going to affect each of our individual absolute threshold. And also our state of mind. Are we bored? Are we stressed? Or are we really focusing? That's going to change our absolute threshold. There is another term called a difference threshold, and that's the minimum difference between two stimuli that can be noticed 50% of the time. And this is the idea if you see um, two pictures, are you able to tell which one is a little tiny bit darker? 
or if you're listening to um, to radios, when can you tell that one is louder than the other? That's the difference threshold. Um, and you could imagine, think about um, being in a room with a light that has a dimmer switch. And so the light is on at some level and I ask you, I'm going to slightly turn the dimmer switch to make it brighter and brighter. And I'm going to ask you when you can tell that it's brighter in the room. And so I may start to turn that dimmer switch a little bit up, up, up. You can't tell the difference. There is more light in the room, but you're not detecting it. And then at some point I hit a threshold, that would be the difference threshold. And you say, yep, now it's brighter. And this is the idea here that these two images are not exactly the same. They're, one is slightly darker than the other. And the question is, can you detect that difference? Can you tell which one is darker or is this below your difference threshold? And again, each of the five senses has its own ratio and its own ability to determine these difference thresholds, and they vary across individuals. This is an example which is darker 13 or 14 and which is darker 15 or 16. See if you can tell. And it turns out that there is a difference between 13 and 14, a just noticeable difference, so a small uh, difference where 14 is a little bit darker than 13. Maybe you noticed that. And there actually is a difference between 15 and 16, um, <clears throat> where 16 is a little bit weaker than 15. 15 is a little bit darker, but they both should appear, probably appear equally the same because the difference in the saturation of the color is below our difference threshold. And so that's the idea. Again, we're doing this on a computer screen. Everybody's computer probably looks a little different, so I'm not sure if you'll be able to exactly uh, tell this um, experiment, but that's the idea. All right, sensory adaptation. This is an adjustment that our, sense, our senses make when stimuli in the environment are unchanging. It's kind of the idea of getting used to a sensory stimulus so you no longer have the same reaction as you initially did. Uh, the idea is that when you are seeing something or hearing something, you are sending action potentials, right? And they're going from your sensory organs into your spinal cord, up to your brain, down, back, you know, there's this whole process. It takes time. It takes a lot of energy. And so our senses are really there to alert us to things, to say, hey, did you see that? right? Or, oh, did you hear that? Did you feel there's something touching you, right? It, they're there to alert us as to what's going on in our environment so that we can react appropriately. Should we be scared? Should we run away? Do we need to protect ourselves? That kind of thing. But once the sensory information has been presented, um, if it just is unchanging, it's a constant then our sensory system adapts, meaning it stops sending so many action potentials. Kind of says like, hey, I've done my job. I've let you know this information is out there and now um, it's up to you. So thinking about, let's say a sound. This one happens all the time. I have children at home. Um, maybe you've worked in a, uh, trying to do homework in a place where it's a little bit noisy. In the beginning, you're constantly hearing that noise, right? If you're, let's say, in a coffee shop and you constantly hear them um, making those espressos and lattes and steaming milk and you're thinking, oh, it's so annoying. These sounds are so annoying because your sensory information, the sensory information is being brought in through your ears and it's alerting you. Hey, there's a lot of noise going on in here. You should hear all of this case you need to re respond in some way. But after a while, if you're sitting there, sitting there studying for an hour or two, you almost don't hear those sounds anymore. And that's because your sensory system has adapted. Your 
hearing set, your um, neurons in your ears are going to fire much less frequently because they've already alerted you to what's going on. And now they're kind of like adapting and saying, okay, I've already told you what's happening. Um, I'm going to kind of take a rest from continuing to send these signals. Our sense that is um, adapts the most dramatically and the most quickly is your sense of smell. This one you've probably noticed too. Um, if you walk into a room and it's very, very smelly, um, you notice it right away. Your neurons are sending signals in your nose saying, oh my goodness, this is a very, very smelly room. But then after maybe five or 10 minutes, you don't smell it anymore. Why is that? It's not because the room doesn't smell anymore. It's because your sensory neurons have adapted. They stop sending those signals. Um, and so you don't uh, smell that smell anymore. Um, it's the same with perfume. And people should take this. This is good, like a public service announcement with perfume and cologne. When you put that on in the morning and it smells delicious to you, and you go, oh, this smells so good. And then you continue to get ready and then think, hmm, I don't smell that perfume or cologne anymore. Let me put a little bit more on. Stop. No, it's not that that perfume or cologne does not smell anymore. It's that your nose has adapted. It has stopped sending those signals because you've smelled that perfume over and over for five or 10 minutes. And so your nose has adapted. But when you walk by anybody else who hasn't yet smelled that, they will be able to smell it just as they should. But if you keep adding more and more on, eh, that's too, maybe too much. All right, so let's start with uh, the five senses. We'll start with vision. And the stimulus here is light. So light is the physical energy that allows us to see. And our eye can only see a small segment of the electromagnetic energy um, that's out there in the world. So you can see, here's kind of the um, electromagnetic energy. It varies by um, wavelength. There are very, very small wavelengths over here. These are gamma rays x-rays, and we talk about wavelength, we're talking about the distance between the peak to the next peak of this wave, this light wave. Um, and then we see this very small segment here of visible light, and you can see it from um, indigo all the way to red, that's the segment we see, and then there are much uh, longer electromagnetic waves that we also can't see. They're around us, all around us, infrared light, microwaves, radio waves. And some animals are able to see some of these other wavelengths. Um, here's like a, a nighttime camera that it works so that you can use infrared light to be able to see. Um, but we see this very small amount here of visible light. So how does the eye work? Um, there are many parts. Light waves here pass first through the cornea, and the cornea is this clear transparent covering um, right over the front of your eye, and it actually sticks out a little bit. If you look at someone at profile, you'll see that their eye kind of bulges out that's the cornea, and that's a protective layer um, so that you don't damage the insides of your eye that's really working to help you see. Um, and sometimes you can scratch your cornea. Maybe some of you have had that experience. My daughter, when she was younger, had the experience of scratching her cornea. It's very painful, but that's why the cornea is there. It's a clear protective coating um, over your eye. It also helps focus incoming light waves. After that, we get to the iris. The iris are the muscles that are responsible for changing the size of the pupil. The iris are the, is the colored part of your eye. So the brown or the green or the blue. Um, and then the pupil is right in the middle. The pupil is that little black hole right in the center of your iris. And the, it literally is a hole that's letting light into your eye. So it's not a black part of your eye, it's a hole. 
um, and that allows and uh, light to enter your eye. Okay. After light goes through the pupil, it hits the lens, and the lens bends and focuses the ray of light, just like the lens on a camera that uh, bends and focuses things so that you can get a clear picture. That's what the lens is doing. It's bending and focusing the light to get a clear picture. And accommodation is the process by which the lens changes shapes in order to focus on objects near or far. If you look right now at something very close up, like maybe your hands right in front of you, and then you look at something far away in the room that you're in, in order to get a clear picture of both your hands, something close, and something far away, that lens has to change shape to focus those rays of light that are coming in to get a clear picture. And that's the process of accommodation. So light waves come in first through the cornea, that um, clear transparent covering. The iris is that colored part that changes the uh, shape or the size of the pupil. Um, light comes in through the pupil, hits the lens. The lens changes its shape to again focus the light. And here we go. If we're looking at a butterfly, right? The light is reflected off the butterfly. It comes in through that cornea, the protective clear coating. Um, the iris is here to make your pupil larger or smaller. The pupil is just a hole right there in the center. And then here's the lens that is changing to focus the rays of light. And actually, um, when light comes in and hits that lens, the image is actually flipped upside down and backwards um, as it's processed. Now, where is this information processed? The retina. This is a layer of the eye that contains the photoreceptor cells. Finally, the receptor cells which are going to transduce light energy into neural activity. And neural activity is basically turning it into an action potential. And the retina is the very back inside of your eye. So right here is your retina. The retina is home to two critical photoreceptors and we talked about rods and cones. Uh, rods, and you can see them here, are given the name because they look like a rod. Here's a microscope picture. Or a cone, just looks a little bit more like a cone. They each are special um, or specialized so that rods are the photoreceptors that enable us to see in dim lighting. They enable us to see in the dark. They are not sensitive to color, um, but useful for night vision. The cones, however, are photoreceptors that allow us to see color and very small details. So within the retina, there are actually a number of cells. And what happens is light now is coming in this way. So imagine um, your pupil is over here and the lens and light comes in this way. And this is the very back of your eye. This is the retina. And what happens is light actually has to go through all of these other cells. It's a very strange setup. It's like inside out. To hit the very back wall, here are your rods and cones. In this case, they look like um, yeah, rods and cones. And then those rods and cones send an action potential. Finally, we have our action potential saying, yep, we see something. We need to send this message that we've seen something. These rods and cones synapse on bipolar cells. These are the green cells here, bipolar cells. And then the bipolar cells synapse on these or connect or send a message to, right? That's the idea of a synapse, to ganglion cells. These are the red cells here. And so it's, and then there are some other, we call horizontal cells and amacrine cells. It's getting a little too complicated for Psych 101, but in the future you would learn more about this. But light goes all the way through the retina, 
activates the rods and cones, which are our photoreceptors, which finally let us send an action potential. Yep, we see light. And then there is a synapse, the photoreceptor synapse on the bipolar cells. Bipolar kind of in the middle, right? So they're connecting with two different cells, bipolar. And then they connect, they synapse to the ganglion cells. And then the axons of the ganglion cells huddle up or bundle up together and leave the back of the eye. And these axons of the ganglion cell make up what we call the optic nerve. And the point where, here we have the eye, right? Light is coming in here through the cornea, through the pupil. Here's the lens focusing the light. The light has to go all the way through to back here to the retina. And the retina houses, right, first uh, the, at the very back, the receptors, the photoreceptors, rods and cones, which synapse on bipolar cells, which synapse on ganglion cells. And then all of those ganglion cell axons bundle up together and leave the back of your eye, because I have to get to the brain, they leave the back of your eye through the optic nerve. So these ganglion cell axons become the optic nerve. They leave the back of your eye. And what's interesting, um, I'll go right here, is again, here now we've got the eye is facing this way. Light is coming down here. So light's coming this way. Um, this is the retina. And when it hits the retina, the, in this case, the red cells are the photoreceptors that synapse on the bipolar cells. These are these kind of blue ones that synapse now on the ganglion cells, which are the yellow ones. And the ganglion cell axons leave the eye, through the back of the eye, to go to the brain through the optic nerve. Now, what's interesting is at this part, of the eye, of the retina, where the optic nerve leaves, what do you notice? There are no photoreceptors there. And so we all have what we call a blind spot. And we have a blind spot in each eye where the optic nerve leaves the eye. Typically, you don't notice your blind spot because your blind spot is in a little different place on each eye, and since we have two eyes, the two images you're getting from each eye overlap, and so where the blind spot falls on one eye um, is different than where the blind spot falls in the other eye, and so you never really notice it. Plus, your eyes are moving all around, so you never really notice it as well. But um, you can actually experimentally find your blind spot, and I have posted an activity for you on Canvas. Um, and so this might be a good time to take a break to do that activity. Um, if you're back, I did want to show you this uh, figure as well. I'm going one slide ahead of the blind spot activity. Um, the fovea, the fovea is the very center of your retina, and this is where your most accurate detailed vision takes place. You can see in the fovea, there are only cones. Cones are your color detail vision. And in fact, how this is set up, you don't really have those bipolar and ganglion cells in front of the fovea, so the light can really go straight there. And this is the very center of your vision and where you can see the clearest. And that makes sense. When you're trying to read something, if you're looking at a book, um, or you might want to try this, look at a book, focus on whatever word you want to read. It's very clear. You're able to read that word. But if you keep your eye focused on that word, you can't really read the words around it if you're keeping your eyes focused on one word. That's because your fovea is that place um, in your visual field that gives you that most accurate vision. And in order to be able to read, you need to see very small details of the letters um, in order to be able to read. So anyhow, the very center of your retina is called the fovea, and that's where you have the most clear, accurate vision. All right, hopefully you found your blind spot. So putting it all together, how do we see? 
Light waves bounce off objects, enter the eye through the cornea, the pupil, the lens. The iris is what dilates and contracts the pupil to control the amount of light that enters the eye. Uh, the cornea and lens focus light waves toward the retina, bending the light and presenting, like I said, that inverted upside down and backwards image. Light strikes the retina, exciting the photoreceptors. The rods and cones fire action potentials. That then activates bipolar cells. The bipolar cells activate the ganglion cells, and the ganglion cells form the, the axons from the ganglion cells form the optic nerve that carries the message to the brain. Once you get to the brain, the optic nerve leaves each eye, and you can see what a great picture here, huh? There's the optic nerve for each eye, um, or I'll come over here. The left eye here is this blue, and the right eye here is the um, red. Images from the right part of your visual field, so we're looking here, the right part of our visual field is anything over here to the right, that's that happy face. Um, is sent to the left side of the brain. And images from the left side of the visual field is processed by the right side of the brain. Um, and you can see how this works. The, um, so the, the information basically uh, is crosses at what we call the optic chiasm right here. And so this happy face that's on the right side of the visual field is actually projected to the left side of the right eye and the left side of the left eye. So what's in your right visual field is projected to the left side of the left eye and the left side of the right eye. Both eyes see it, right? Because if you close your eyes, you can still see your pretty much whole visual field. But what's in the um, right visual field is projected to the left side of your left eye and the left or the inner side of your right eye. And you can see that the outer, the we call this the outer um, portion of the retina, that information from the left side goes down here. And at this optic chiasm, it does not cross. It stays on the left side of the brain. And the information from the left side of the right eye, or we call this the nasal side, closer to the nose, actually crosses and gets to the left hemisphere. And in that way, whatever you see in the right visual field is processed by the left hemisphere. Same with what you see in the left visual field, this heart. In the left visual field, this light is projected to the right side of your left eye or the nasal side of your left eye and to the outer or the left side of your right eye. The information from this nasal side crosses to get to the right occipital, the right part of the brain and the outer part of the retina stays on that same side. And so the whole um, heart that someone is looking at is processed in the right side of the brain. Information is first, visual information is first processed in the occipital lobe. We talked about that, which is all the way in the back of the brain. So you can see that visual information has to go all the way to the back of the brain. It has to take a very long route. And as I said, the left occipital lobe is getting information or processing information from the right visual field and the right occipital lobe process information from the left visual field. After being processed by what we call primary visual cortex, that's the first part of the occipital lobe that processes visual information. Visual information is actually sent to lots of different areas of the brain, and it turns out that we have different areas of the brain that process different types of visual information. There's a part of the brain that processes motion, there's a part of the brain that processes color, detail, even a pro part of the brain that processes faces. 
So information is all spread up. And then it's pretty amazing that we see one cohesive um, vision of the world, even though it's processed in so many different places in the brain. Theories of color vision. Um, we have a few theories of color vision, none of which are perfect. That's why they're theories. We're still figuring this all out. Um, the trichromatic color theory, we believe this takes place in the retina. In that theory, we have three kinds of cones. Um, we have cones that are most receptive. These are the short wavelength cones to blue violet colors. We have medium wavelength cones that are most responsive to the color green. And we have long wavelength cones that are most responsive to yellow and red. And so we see colors based on the different receptors that are active. So if you're seeing this color, um, I don't know, right here, this greenish yellow color, your brain is able to say, well, I have, what is this? 80% um, of my medium wavelength cones active and 90% of my long wavelength cones active and none of my short wavelength cones active. And so that means I'm seeing this greenish color. And so it's really based on a proportion of how many of each type of cones are active. Now, this is an incomplete theory. It can't explain what we call a negative after image. Um, and I'm gonna go through that in one second. In terms of the cones and theories of uh, color vision, this may be where color blindness comes in. This is when someone loses or damages one or more kind of cone. You can use these color plates to detect uh, color blindness. Um, so this is a 45 in red dots, kind of on this green background. Um, the most common deficiencies are detecting red or green. So if someone was colorblind, they would not be able to detect the difference here. Um, and we see males have uh, greater um, frequency of colorblindness than females. Like I said, the idea of different rods and cones doesn't explain everything about our color vision. And so there is another theory called the opponent process theory of color vision. In this case, receptor cells are linked in pairs, um, blue, yellow, green and red, and black and white, which work in opposition to each other. And we think this happens at the ganglion cell level. And so when you're looking at a color that is more yellow than blue, the yellow uh, cell fires and inhibits its blue counterpart because these are two are linked. And what happens in a negative color after image is after prolonged exposure, let's say to the color yellow, that cell fatigues and no longer fires. And because it is linked to a blue cell, it actually makes us see the color blue. And that would help explain these negative after images and the after images disappear quickly since cells recover from fatigue very quickly. And you can try this if you want here in which I want you would fix your eyes on this center cross here um, for 30 seconds. And after 30 seconds, shift your gaze to this blank white area. So what you could do is pause this here and do the, do this activity. So after 30 seconds and you've done the activity, what did you see here? You probably saw the same shape, but different colors. So instead of the blue, you would have seen yellow. And instead of the red, you would have seen green. And that's the idea of this opponent process theory of color vision. All right, moving on to hearing. Vision is the part of uh, sensation we know the most about. What about hearing? hearing or, or we call it audition that's the sense of hearing and we hear by the physical stimulus of sound waves those are movements of air molecules that result in alternating zones of high and low pressure moving through the environment and it's these vibrations of the air molecules that we call uh, sound waves and sound waves are transduced 
into action potentials and then sent to the brain. There are three main qualities of sound. We have the loudness of sound and that's determined by the amplitude of or the height of the sound wave. So a higher amplitude or a taller sound wave um, is louder. Pitch, that's the, is it a high sound or a low sound? That's determined by the frequency of the sound waves. So a longer frequency from um, end to end here would be a lower sound. And then these shorter frequency, right, from the top to the top of the next one that's shorter, that would be a higher pitch. And then timbre is the quality or the sound of the music or the, of the sound. So you could have two sounds with the same loudness and the same pitch that seem different. So two singers who are singing the exact same note still sound different. That's the timbre. That's the quality of the, of the sound that you're hearing. So the ear is broken into three main parts. We have the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. And we're going to go through this. I'm going to actually skip right to here. So we start with the outer ear. That's the part you see. That's the kind of cartilage that's attached to the side of your head. And this alters the reflections of sound waves, brings the sound waves into the auditory canal and focuses them on the eardrum. It also helps us in locating sounds. Then the auditory canal, these, you can see the sound waves are going through the auditory canal, it's the outer ear, till we get to the eardrum. Here's our middle ear. The tympanic membrane or eardrum vibrates at the same frequency as the sound wave. So here's your eardrum and it starts vibrating just like a regular drum because these are these pressure waves and then your eardrum starts to vibrate. Next are these three tiny little bones, um, middle ear bones, the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup, and they start vibrating too because one of them is attached right here to the eardrum. So as the eardrum vibrates, so does this bone and this bone and this bone, and they all are transmitting these vibrations through the middle ear. And the last bone here is attached to what we call the oval window. And so as this bone is vibrating, it's causing the oval window to vibrate. Now, when we get to the inner ear, the inner ear is this part, this blue part here. It is filled with fluid. Up until then, everything's been filled with air. The inner ear is filled with fluid. It's a kind of this snail shell or snail shaped inner ear structure. It's called the cochlea. And there are three different fluid filled tunnels. And how this works, the um, receptors in your ear are called hair cells. Okay. So we had rods and cones in the eye. We have hair cells here in the ear. They are attached, the hair cells are attached to this basilar membrane, okay, and this is basically taking this snail shelled, snail shaped um, cochlea and just flattening it out. Imagine just flattening it out. Um, you've got the hair cells or the, the receptors attached to the basilar membrane, and then you have a tectoral membrane, that's the top. And as the fluid moves, right, this um, bone from the middle ear is starting to vibrate what we call the oval window and that starts to vibrate or move the fluid in the inner ear and as the fluid moves in this inner ear this tectoral membrane starts to push down at that kind of same vibrations as the um, sound waves and as it pushes down, it pushes down on the hair cells. And when those hair cells get pushed down on by the tectoral membrane, 
you get an action potential. That's how um, those hair cells get excited and a message is um, sent. So fluid moves uh, the basilar membrane across the tectoral membrane and this bends the hair cells. And the hair cells start to um, start the action potential. So the tectoral membrane is this top and the basilar membrane is kind of bending and again you're getting the um, action potentials. So sound waves enter the outer ear or the pinna, that's the part that's attached to your head. The sound is funneled through the auditory canal to the eardrum. The tiny bones are called the ossicles. They start to vibrate. This causes the fluid in the cochlea to vibrate and the hair cells on the basilar membrane bend in response. And that starts um, our auditory that starts our action potential, which then allows us to hear. And then information goes to the different parts of the brain, starting at auditory cortex, um, which is in the temporal lobe, the temporal lobe, then to the thalamus, um, or thalamus, then to the auditory cortex, and on from there. How do we process pitch in the brain? Well, there are a couple of ways. Uh, this is our inner ear or our cochlea, that all wound up snail looking object. We have the frequency theory in that the basilar membrane vibrates at the same frequency of the sound. So frequency theory um, to produce action potentials. But that can only be for low pitch sounds because this basilar membrane can't continue to, um, it has a maximum uh, number of vibrations it can do. And so for lower pitch sounds, you basically have the whole um, uh, cochlea, the whole basilar membrane, kind of vibrating at the same frequency as the sound waves. Place theory is for higher pitch sounds, and it says that each part of the um, uh, basilar membrane will vibrate at a different frequency when it gets to higher pitched sounds. So when you hear a 2000 hertz sound, you've got this part of the cochlea vibrating. 5000 hertz sounds, you've got this part of the cochlea vibrating. And the current uh, theory for pitch combines both versions that low frequency sounds are best explained by the frequency theory, like I said, and high frequency sounds are best explained by the place theory. If you have hearing damage, um, two different types, sensory neural deafness, this is when you have damage to the cochlea, the hair cells or the auditory nerves. So this is talking about inner ear damage. This can be treated with hearing aids if it's not extensive damage or something called a cochlear implant. This type of um, deafness is usually caused by genetics, disease, drugs, uh, exposure repeatedly to very loud noises, um, an inadequate thyroid gland, etc. Or conduction hearing impairment. This is when you have uh, hearing problems due to problems in the middle ear where the bones of the middle ear aren't able to transmit the sound waves. This can be caused by a tumor in the middle ear, infection, disease. This can be corrected by surgery or by hearing aids. You can tell if you've got conduction deafness, um, the person can hear their own voice because sound bypasses the middle ear. Can hearing be recovered? Um, Hearing aids amplify incoming sound waves so the hair cells can detect them easier. And cochlear implants pick up sound waves from the environment with a microphone and then turn them into electrical impulses that stimulate the auditory nerves. So those are two different ways of trying to recover hearing. All right, chemical senses. The sense of smell is a chemical sense. Uh, we call the sense of smell olfaction 
And this involves sensing chemicals, which are odor molecules in the environment. So someone smelling something and you're smelling these chemicals. They go to the olfactory epithelium. This is a postage si stamp size patch of tissue, three inches into your nostril. It houses millions of olfactory receptor neurons. And when enough odor molecules attach to an olfactory receptor neuron, that's the um, sensory neuron, it fires. You get an action potential. And then olfactory information is carried to the olfactory bulb in the brain. So the odor molecules attach here to the receptor and then basically sends this information to the brain. And you're looking for um, the, the physical stimulus is odor or chemical molecules in, this, in the air. Um, sexy smells, well, there are something called pheromones. Um, animals use different kinds of pheromones to communicate with members of the same species. Um, there are receptors that only respond to pheromones, and those are, like I said, these chemicals released by animals that affect sexual behavior of other animals. Um, animals um, are more affected, perhaps, by pheromones than humans, but humans do release pheromones through glands in their armpits, breasts, lips, other parts of the body. And the area like a, that responds to pheromones is tiny in adult humans compared to other animals, but still does respond and can cause increased activity in the hypothalamus area. Hypothalamus is important for sexual behavior. Um, and we find that women who spend time together, like uh, in a dorm or a roommate situation, uh, because of pheromones, tend to have synchronized menstrual cycle. That seems to be due to pheromones. Um, intimate relationships increase the regularity of menstrual, uh, the menstrual cycle. And exposure to female pheromones affect male testosterone. So um, even though we don't know it's happening, um, and it, it, pheromones do affect us even as humans. Taste is the sense of gustation. Um, taste and smell are really important. They work together. And so if you lose your sense of smell, you lose quite a bit of your sense of taste. It really gives things flavor. And you've probably experienced this if you were sick and have a stuffy nose one day um, and you try to eat something, it doesn't taste very good. It doesn't taste like anything because smell and taste are, are very important to give us the flavor. And that's why when somebody does have damage to their sense of smell, um, they often lose a lot of weight. They don't want to eat, nothing tastes very good, and it actually can be very dangerous. Um, uh, papillae are housed in taste buds, which contain our sensory receptors. They're located on your tongue, the roof of your mouth, they line your cheeks, and we can detect five basic tastes. Sweet taste, sour taste, salty, bitter. We always thought there were four until recently we've added a fifth called umami. And what is umami flavor? It gives you some examples here. Tomatoes, cheese, meat, fish, dried shiitake mushrooms. There's even a restaurant called Umami Burger. You could look that up and get an idea of what these umami types of flavors are. How this taste works is molecules from food dissolve in the saliva and attach to matching receptors on the taste buds. Once a molecule binds to a matching receptor, you get receptor, you get an action potential. There's that transduction. And information is sent to the thalamus, where it's routed to other brain processing centers. Taste receptors constantly regenerate. This is, a, this is important because your mouth is a pretty dangerous place, right? We burn our tongues when we eat hot soup. You might um, hurt your tongue if you eat a very crunchy, sharp tortilla chip. Um, so we're kind of killing our taste receptors all the time. Luckily, they do come back every about 10 days. This process slows as we get older. 
and smoking and drinking impair the receptor's ability to receive food molecules. We taste less. In terms of evolution and culture, we are drawn towards sweet foods. Sweet foods usually mean they're calorie rich and they're good for, uh, for us in terms of glucose, which our body needs. And we try to stay away from bitter tastes and bitter tastes are often poisonous. And so we have kind of developed um, an attraction to foods that are um, good for us. Looking at this pizza, I'm not saying um, healthy necessarily, but has things we need in our body for our body to function um, and stay away from things that are bitter, which usually can indicate poison. Um, touch. Our skin cell has, our skin has lots of different receptors for different types of touch. Um, so the epidermis is our skin and we've got thermoreceptors for temperature, Pacinian corpuscles to sense vibration, Meissner's corpuscles um, for slight touch, and many, many other uh, sensory receptor touch cells in our skin. Um, nociceptive pain that's caused by heat, cold, chemicals, and pressure. Um, you could think about what life would be like without any pain. Um, and in fact, there are individuals who are missing these pain receptors. And it's actually, although maybe it sounds good on the initially not to be able to feel pain, it's quite dangerous because people can um, get very bad injuries without knowing it. They can burn their hand very badly, put their hand on their the stove and not even realize their hand is burning or have a, hit their arm into a door and break their arm and not know that. So it can be very dangerous um, to not be able to feel pain. We have two pain pathways, a fast pain pathway that's made up of a large myelinated axon. We get that stinging feeling when you first hurt yourself. And then the slow pain pathway made up of small unmyelinated axons. And that's after you've hurt yourself, you kind of get this dull, aching, throbbing pain. Axons from both pathways converge on the spinal cord and brain. Pain is subjective and depends on many factors. One of the really interesting um, aspects of pain is what we call the gate control theory of pain. And what this is, is that when certain nerve receptors are activated due to an injury, a gate to the brain is open to allow the sensation of pain. But non-painful influences can interfere with those pain influences to reach the pain and actually close the gate. Your attention and emotion can close the pain gate and cause a decrease in the feeling of pain. You have probably experienced this yourself. Maybe you have a headache, you wake up in the morning with a headache and you just can't, it just hurts so bad, but then you have to go to work. You go to work and you kind of feel better. Your attention is focused in another place. Your emotions are focused at work. And so you're not focusing on the pain and in some ways that pain gate closes. Then when you get home, the pain comes back. You go, oh, that headache, I've had it all day. That's like football players also who play through a game with an injury because they're focused on something other than the pain. Um, and then as soon as their football game is over, they go, oh my gosh, I've got a torn muscle or something like that. Phantom limb is another type of pain. And I did some research on this. It was actually the very first research I did as an undergrad when I volunteered in a research lab. Um, this is people who haven't had an amputation still feel like they experience intense pain in the limb they have lost. This occurs in 50 to 80% of amputees and it's very strange because they won't have an arm but they'll say, gee, my, my right hand hurts even though they don't have a right hand anymore. More. Can be burning, tingling, very intense pain, cramping pain. And it seems as though the brain reorganizes. Um, and so even though there's no hand or arm anymore, um, the part of the brain that used to be receptive to pain in that part of the brain um, is innervated. Is There are other neurons that surround that, that, that area that move in 
to the area. And so you get pain in that area from other um, kind of sensations. We have a kinesthetic sense. That's our sensory system that conveys information about body position. Where is your body in space? Um, our proprioceptors are located in your muscles and joints, so you know how far your arm is bent or how far your leg is bent, things like that. And our vestibular sense, this is our sense of balance. This is found in the inner ear, in the semicircular canals and vestibular sacs, and this helps us with balance. Perception, so that was all sensation, just how do you get information from the world into your body, but then the idea of perception, how do you work with it? How do you make sense of those sensations? Um, and the idea of perception, what you see is not always what you get, right? Is this glass half empty or half full? We could have that discussion. Um, so perception is an active process by which our brains try to make meaning out of sensory stimuli. Our perceptions are usually affected by our experiences, our personal interpretations of the world, and we come up with illusions, which are perceptions that are inconsistent with sensory data. Uh, your book has a number of illusions. Here's one of them, which line looks longer, right? If you look here versus here. Well, probably this line looks longer to you because it appears farther away. This line looks shorter even though the two lines are exactly the same. This is our experience with the world. When we look at a corner like this, this corner looks closer to us than this. And so we, our brain perceives this line to be shorter than this line. The moon illusion. The moon looks much larger when it is down low, if you've ever noticed that, than when it's up in the sky. Um, it's not that the moon is changing size. It's just that when it's down low, you can compare it to other things on the ground and say, wow, this is a very large object. Whereas when it's up in the sky, there's really nothing to compare it to. And so it seems smaller. Gestalt psychology. This is the tendency for our brain to organize stimuli into a whole rather than perceiving parts and pieces. And so you can look again, this is a lot of this is in your book, figure ground. We tend to perceive um, visual stimuli as figures existing on a background. On this map, we're focusing on this one state of Texas. The rest becomes the background. But in some cases where you can't really tell which is the figure and which is the ground, um, depending on what you're focusing on, depends on um, what you see right? So if you focus on the black part, you can see a vase, um, and then the yellow is the background. If you focus on the yellow part, then you see two faces, and the black part is the background. In terms of the Gestalt organizational principles, uh, the law of proximity, we tend to perceive objects that are near to each other as a unit, so we tend to see this as three groups of dots be, rather than 36 individual dots because the ones that are near we kind of perceive as a group. Um, law of similarity, we tend to see objects as a group if they share features. So we tend to see these as lines of uh, squares, circles, squares, circles, as opposed to uh, horizontal rows of alternating shapes. And the law of connectedness, we see objects as a group if there's something that connects them. So we kind of see these dots as a group and this set of four dots as a group with the line connecting them. Um, because even though all the dots are the same, we're looking at these things that seem to make them connected. The law of closure, we tend to fill in incomplete parts of a line, right? We, complete, we think this is a circle even though the line is broken. And the law of continuity, we perceive groups where objects appear to be going in the same direction. So we perceive this figure made up of two lines that are continuous and intersect. 
um, rather than two angles that are brought together, right? We don't typically see that figure as two kind of sideways Vs. We see them as two lines that are crossing. Depth perception, this is the ability to perceive three-dimensional um, objects and judge distances is very interesting. We look, we study this particularly in um, developmental psychology. When do children get the idea of depth perception? And we use this virtual cliff. Um, so you can see there's this checkered red and white stripe or red and white checker on the top here and the bottom. And there's glass over this. And so as the baby is crawling, it looks, um, the question is, will they go over the edge of the virtual cliff? Will they notice that there is this drop? Um, and at some point, this idea of depth perception and will stop, won't go over the visual cliff. Um, so this finding suggests that depth perception, by the time a baby is crawling, um, that has developed. We get depth perception cues by both binocular cues. That means information gathered from both eyes to help judge depth and distance, as well as monocular cues. Those are depth cues that only require the use of one eye. And we use both types of cues to have really good depth perception. You could look at this um, and, and read a little more in your book about what are some of the monocular cues, one eye cues in this photograph that can help us uh, tell something about depth? All right. Uh, perceptual consistency. This is the tendency to perceive objects in our environment as stable in terms of shape, size, and color, regardless of changes in the sensory data we receive. So shape constancy. The idea that we know these are a bunch of lockers, and so they are all probably the same shape. Even though this one, you can tell what your eye is seeing is definitely not the same shape as this one, but we still perceive this door as the same shape because our perception is, our knowledge of locker doors is that they are all the same shape. So even though we're sensing a very tall, thin, um, object here. It's actually the same shape as these locker doors. Size consistency. We know cars are perceived as large even when you look at them from an airplane because you know cars don't change to be teeny tiny little things. And color constancy. We know strawberries are red so when you look at this you see red strawberries even though they're under a green light and you're actually seeing, sensing a green color but our brain perceives them as red. This is where um, our brain is pretty amazing and our experience in the world really changes and uh, kind of builds the sensory and perceptual experience we have. All right, everybody, thank you very much.